Hello everyone, Professor McLean here. During this foundation unit, I'd like to take some time to review the origins of eFlows. With the growing attention to this management topic worldwide, many people are being exposed to it for the first time, and this gives the impression that eFlows are something new. While it's true that there are many new and innovative aspects of eFlows, the basic concepts and motivations may be traced far into the past. Understanding these origins and the evolution of eFlow science and practice over the years gives us a better appreciation for where we are today and for the differences in eFlow's approaches that can still be found around the world. The earliest references I found to flow-related concerns in water resources management come from the public health and fisheries sectors. Interest in river flows emerged in the public health sector in the mid-1800s when physicians began to link illness with contaminated water. This stimulated research into the fate and dynamics of contaminants, especially organic wastes in rivers. London and the River Thames were the site of some of the earliest activities of this type. Meanwhile, in river fisheries, managers became concerned by the widespread construction of dams and reservoirs that depleted river stocks and blocked fish passage. Clear references to these concerns and the recommended actions appear in California fisheries reports just after the turn of the century. In the public health sector, the focus was on flows required for dilution and also the support of processes to decompose organic wastes. Reading these texts, it's extraordinary how confident public health officials were in the self-purification abilities of rivers, even with only very small flows. Chandler's quote from an 1873 report is evidence of this. If you need, pause the video here and read these quotes for yourself. The quote of Lethaby from 1867 shows that health officials were already aware of the importance of dilution factors and the need for sufficient time to allow decomposition of wastes through a series of processes including microbial decomposition, uptake by plants, oxidation, and something to do with fish. Oh, and by the way, infusorial animals is a now unused way of referring to microbes. And I had to look that one up too. Rules preventing the obstruction of fish passage in rivers date back to the Magna Carta, which was published in the year 1215. Yes, 1215, that's 800 years ago. But the earliest reference I've found to the need for an in-stream flow comes from this California Fish and Game Commission report from 1914. In it, the superintendent of hatcheries, W.H. Shebley, calls for the state legislature to, quote, compel the owners of fish ladders to allow sufficient water to pass through their fishways at all times to allow the fish a free passage through the ladders as well as support the fish life below the dams during the minimum flow of water. He then mentions that he studied low flow conditions for a number of years and recommends that the required flow releases be equivalent to, quote, 10% of the amount of water in each stream, river, or creek measured halfway between the watershed and the mouth of the stream. This is a quite specific recommendation and a good opportunity for me to mention the importance of considering the fine points of any recommendation. 10% of flow is widely cited as an e-flow quantity and too often applied under year-round conditions, but I've never seen a serious study that suggested that 10% be applied this way to meet environmental objectives. W.H. Shebley is also not suggesting this. A close look at his recommendation makes clear that he suggests this amount only during the period of natural low flow in the river, which he notes is in the summer and fall. This is thus a flow to be protected only under special natural low flow conditions, not year-round. Other credible studies that refer to 10% also consider this level of flow to be only for short-term survival of species. Another interesting aspect of Shebley's report is his reference to the difficulty of getting the dam operators to comply with rules for e-flow releases. We, of course, continue to struggle with this today. In his case, he suggests that the summer and fall flow 10% releases he recommends should not result in serious impacts on power plants or irrigationists. It's true that he asked for only 10% of the water during the minimum flow period, but we don't know the opinion of the dam operators on this point. 
Take a moment if you need to, to pause the video and read this quote. By the 1950s, flow science related to both public health and fisheries had advanced significantly, but largely independent of one another. The applications of new knowledge were also spreading around the world, but at very different paces and levels of success. As you might imagine, the strong and universal interest in public health caused application of this form of flow protection to spread rapidly. The volumes recommended were generally quite small, and there would have been very little, if any, opposition to implementation. As we saw in Shebley's report, there was opposition to fisheries-related flow releases from the beginning, and these opposing interests would have slowed the progress of application both in public policy as well as on-the-ground implementation. Other important distinctions also emerged between the two approaches to flow science. In the public health sector, emphasis shifted from using the river as a waste treatment system to construction of waste treatment plants and regulation of waste discharges. Low flows in the river became not an objective of water resource management, but instead a design criteria for pollution prevention programs. Hydrologists were asked to devise statistical indices for natural low flow conditions, and regulators then adjusted allowable pollution discharges so that water quality standards would be met at all flows above these levels. Laws were also enacted to require that those flows used in the design criteria be protected in water allocation processes, thereby ensuring that pollution prevention measures were effective. Take a moment to think about the approach this sector took and be sure you understand the distinction with earlier river-focused approaches. The objectives changed, and I've stressed the point that e-flows are all about meeting objectives. The new objective was not to preserve any level of riverine health, it was only to control water pollution. But these public health-based measures of minimum flow levels remain the only form of legal flow protection in many parts of the world. Meanwhile, in the fisheries sector, fisheries biologists were researching the relationships between flow levels and the characteristics of fish habitats and their food resources. This knowledge was applied in what may have been the first ecology-based e-flow assessment. In 1941, the U.S. government began construction of Granby Dam and Reservoir on the upper Colorado River with the aim of supplying both hydropower and irrigation waters to rapidly growing towns and agricultural areas on the plains east of the Rocky Mountains. Conservationists and some residents, however, raised concerns about the 91-meter-tall dam and nearly 30-square-kilometer reservoir beginning years earlier in the design phase, including concerns over the fate of downstream river reaches valued for their scenic beauty and blue-ribbon trout fisheries, which supported a booming tourism industry as well. In response to these concerns, the document by the U.S. Senate authorizing construction called for downstream flow releases from the dam of a magnitude and timing to maintain a, quote, live stream preserving scenic attractions and fish life. From 1947 to 1949, biologists of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service studied the relationships between the quantity and quality of fish habitat with flow levels. They distinguished between pool, riffle, fast, deep, and slow, shallow habitat types and considered quality characteristics such as water temperature, uh, oxygen content, food production, available shelter, and conditions favorable or unfavorable to reproduction. The result of the study was a daily schedule of recommended flow releases below Granby Dam to preserve the fishing and recreational facilities and scenic values of the Colorado River. But as we already know from H.W. Shelby, it is considerably difficult to get the owners of dams to allow sufficient water to pass their dams. The U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, which operated Granby Dam, did not implement the recommendations of the Fish and Wildlife Service and the quality of the fishery and its associated values declined as expected. So, take home messages from this lecture. The origins of e-flows can be traced to needs identified in both the public health and fishery sectors more than a century ago, but these needs were quite different and the related science and application progressed along different paths and spread around the world at different times and different rates. 
Approaches related to public health spread quickly and are now nearly everywhere in the world, while approaches related to fisheries spread slowly and have never reached many areas of the world. Today, through international processes like the Sustainable Development Goals, the pressure to implement ecology-based e-flows is increasing. But many countries, instead of adopting true ecology-based e-flows approaches, have simply continued public health-based approaches, thinking that they will also be sufficient for ecological needs. The content of this course will make clear that this approach is not sufficient. That's the end of this lecture. Thanks very much.